Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out to our Laker Lessons presentation. I'm going to introduce our guest for today, Mr. Kelvin Miller. Kelvin is a native of Macon, Georgia. As an undergraduate student, he attended Clark Atlanta University and then transferred to Clayton State University, where he became an alumni in 2014. He continued his education and obtained a master's degree at Georgia Southern in 2018. Kelvin has worked in higher education for seven years at various institutions. He is a father to one, a mentor to some, and an impactful leader to all individuals he encounters. So without further ado, here is Mr. Kevin Miller. Thank you. Hello? Okay. Thank you, Mr. McGrickle. I appreciate the uh, warm introduction. Um, as he stated, I am an alumni from Clay State University. I graduated in the spring of 2014, and it has been an amazing experience since then to be able to circle back and now become a member of the staff here at Clay State University in the Department of Housing Residence Life, uh, where I once served as an undergrad as a resident assistant, as well as an executive assistant to the Director of Housing during that time. So it's been a long road, it's been a long journey. I've been very appreciative of any of the mentors, any of the colleagues that I have met along the way that have brought me to this point. And it's been an experience nonetheless, learning more about colleges and institutions, specifically as it pertains to those that I worked at, uh, whether that was in my graduate experience or in my professional experience. So from those experiences, I learned a lot about what college really is. So as an undergraduate, uh, I was able to involve myself in a lot of different organizations. And from my involvement in those organizations, I networked with everybody that I could, anybody that I could meet with, I shook hands with, exchanged names, numbers, just so that I could make myself more available to opportunities. And that later on provided fruitful experiences for me in my graduate career. Uh, once I went to graduate school, I was able to make connections there. That then led to the beginning of my actual career in higher education. When I started, I had no clue that this was even a career. So I was on a money mission. I didn't care exactly what I majored in, but I wanted to get some money. That's all I knew. So speaking to different professors, speaking to different professionals and administrators at the university, they kind of guided me in my decision making and eventually I stumbled upon higher education. And from that point, I learned everything that I could from the history of higher education, starting with it being something that was very theologically based all the way up until it becoming a thing for anyone. So as of, you could say, the late few decades, um, it has transitioned to a very technology-based center, and now you can learn completely online. You do not have to visit a campus, and you can get an entire associate's degree, bachelor's degree, even a master's and a doctorate degree completely online whatever have to, without, without ever having to step on a campus. And that has changed the trajectory of what college looks like. So for me and my journey, at one point in time, I can honestly say I thought college was a scam. Because I said, well, why am I paying all of this money to get a piece of paper just for them to qualify me to work in a position where others may not have that same piece of paper and they may be getting paid even more than I am, just simply based off of their experience of working in the field or working in that particular area of expertise. So I took it upon myself to do some study. I took it upon myself to do some research, uh, specifically when I was in grad school, to learn more about what college really meant. And when I got the opportunity to sit 
with vice presidents and interview vice presidents. I also interned to shadow uh, the vice president of student affairs. His name is Dr. Scott Lingro at the University of West Georgia. It gave me an opportunity to really learn the bones and the anatomy of what college really was about. And from there, I learned that college really is a scam. It can be a scam if you allow yourself to be scammed by it. So what I mean by that is, uh, as incoming students, as incoming freshmen, you're recruited by most institutions. They have recruitment packages, they have referral packages, where they want you to come to their institution. They want you to bring your talent, your skills, your abilities to their institution to make it the best possible institution it can be. And every university or institution of higher learning is made up of its faculty and its staff, but it literally is the heartbeat of the students. So from that expertise level, I, I did some, some more searching, some, some more digging. I said, okay, if I think college is a scam, why? Why do I think it's a scam? So looking at the percentage rates of graduates from institutions and converting that graduation rate to the completion rate of the individuals who actually landed jobs within their field, it's anywhere between 15 and 18 percent, and these are based off of metrics from 2019. Uh, Post-COVID, we're still kind of in COVID now, but post-COVID year starting 2020, those numbers have doing it down even more. So with that being said, it's very easy for someone to go along the lines and say, yeah, college is a scam. I, I paid all of this money. I went to these classes. Excuse me, I did everything that they said to do, and I still can't find a job in my field. So the focus from our research from that point is, where's the gap? What are we missing from this point to the next that makes students feel like college is a scam? Like, I could go and get the expertise. I could go and get the experience from other positions and never have to complete a degree and still make the money that I need to take care of my family, still make the money that I need to pursue my dreams. I can go into entrepreneurship and never have to step into a college facility, never have to be a part of a, a dorm room or residential experience. I can literally just do it on my own. Why should I go to college? So within that gap, there is a special space of networking with individuals in a community that you have never had the opportunity to do so outside of a university at a particular time. So when you're at a university, when you're at a college, or an institution of higher learning, you are put into a space for, depending on your degree program, two to four to maybe even six years, to literally be in the same physical space as some individuals who have direct ties to some of the dreams that you're trying to make. Um, and when it comes down to understanding how to actually make your dreams become a reality, if you didn't know anything about Clay State, one of our many models is dreams made real. So with that being said, the opportunity to take whatever dream you have from wherever you are in the United States of America or outside of the United States, and you come here, you have the opportunity to pursue your education, you're literally trying to take that dream and figure out how you can make your dream a reality. Now, some of us dream to be entertainers, some of us dream to be educators, some of us dream to be individuals who just impact others' lives. And in that regard, college gives you the vehicle to be able to get to those spaces with the transportation of the courses that you take, with the transportation of a major that gives you kind of a structure along the lines of what courses you take and what you learn in those courses, and the benefit from being in those spaces, to me, far outweighs some of the cons that many people introduce when they talk about, oh, I'm, I'm a part of a university membership, whereas it may be, I just go to college. So those are two different perspectives. There are a lot of individuals that choose to go into college for their parents, for the betterment of individuals that are around them, but not always for themselves. And a lot of times they can find themselves lost in translation, just trying to figure out where they're gonna go from point A to point B to get to that journey. So for me, Clayton State provided more than a roadmap, it provided me guides along the way. Uh, it provided me a GPS that I couldn't have formed myself outside of the university. And that's what makes me believe it's not a scam. 
because if I would have tried to navigate it on my own, I'm pretty sure I still would have been successful in my own right, but I would not have had the same guys. I would not have had the same roadmap. I would not have had the same perks and opportunities that I was awarded that I benefited from simply because I was in the right spaces at the right time with the right individuals. Um, in addition to the journey that I think every student decides to make when they make a choice to say, well, I'm gonna to go to this college, is what happens afterwards. And I think that's what gives us more of an idea to say, college is a scam, because I came here, I paid my money to get a degree, I have the degree now, and I'm moving forward just trying to figure out what job opportunities are out there for me, and I've been applying. It's not that I don't have the credentials, it's not that I don't have what it takes, but I'm not getting accepted. And when I do get an interview, the interview goes well, I might have a first, a second, a third interview, and I'm still not getting a job. So this opportunity that was afforded to me that I paid so much money for or took out student loans for, I didn't get the benefit from it because I didn't get the job that I wanted. So for a lot of people, they feel like I'm being scammed. Um, a lot of students that I've met with and worked with in my time and my experience of different professional areas, whether that was in academic advising, whether it was in residence and housing, uh, whether it was in intramural sports, they literally told me, I don't understand the first two years of college. Why do I have to take core classes? This is stuff I learned in high school. This is pointless. Why can't I just skip to my major? So in our conversations, I was very strategic about letting them know those core classes build a foundation to allow you to learn literally what the college experience is about. A lot of students don't know when you come to college that it is a personal experience and a professional experience. So most students think, I'm coming to college, they're gonna give me everything that I need, I'm gonna pay this money, I'm gonna get this degree, I'm gonna take this degree and go ahead and exchange it for a job. That is absolutely not how it works. It is literally a personal and a professional experience that is contingent upon what you decide to do with your experience. It is exactly what you make it. If college is boring to you, it could be your institution, but it also could be you as a person. So what I ingrained to students in meeting them, especially freshman students, students that have just come to the horizon of, I think I want to go to school, is have a plan. Whatever your plan is, if it aligns with your degree, use it to your advantage. If you can't find a degree that aligns with your plan, find a way to make it work. So, for example, there are, at this point in time, there's literally almost a major that can fit with any job experience that you want, including some of the, the more, I guess you could say, innovative positions, such as like social media management, um, anything that has to do with the technological field, there are positions literally for that now, and colleges and universities are catching on to the wave and providing programs and experiences that allow students to be able to grasp all of the tools and knowledge that they need to know in order to be in that functional area by literally applying, making it their major, and having a structured understanding of how to take those courses and translate them into an experience that they can use for a career. Uh, with that being said, the idea that college can be a scam is based off of you not doing your research, you following along with trends that may just be temporary, and you're doing it for other individuals who would not benefit from your degree. So as I tell students, when you decide that you come for a college experience, you're not just coming for yourself, but you are. So with that being said, that basic explanation is, I'm here to get as much information as I can, whether it's inside or outside of the classroom, I'm paying for this experience. So I want to, to maximize every avenue there is, every resource that's given to me, even some of the resources that aren't given to me, I can take the opportunity and find out, well, what is this about? What does this office do? at this university? What do they provide? Because every office here serves a utility for students, faculty, and staff. And if it doesn't, there is no reason for it to be here. So as a student, I found myself being involved and engaging 
in different organizations, and those organizations led me to meeting certain people in those departments and offices, and it gave me an opportunity to learn what they did. From that, I started to gain a better understanding of how college could not be a scam, because those very individuals, had I not decided to go to college, I would never have met them. I would have never had any connection to them. There would have never been any space for influence. I met some of my best friends, literally being in the space of a college atmosphere. And although the statistics show, as an incoming freshman in your representative class, when you look to your left and you look to your right, if you're at convocation, there's a very high likelihood that those same individuals may not be with you on graduation day. And that still stands true. But in my opinion, that's literally up to you. If you want to be the same person that's sitting there from convocation to graduation, the choice is yours. Now that doesn't mean that there won't be hardships, that doesn't mean that you can't take breaks, that doesn't mean that there won't, there won't be things that come up in life that will present themselves as obstacles or even step ladders to the experience of you getting a degree, but it doesn't mean that it's final. So a lot of times I tell students, there'll be a lot of commas in your life, but not a lot of periods. So you'll have an opportunity to pause and reflect and think about some of the choices and decisions that you made to get to the point where you are, but you don't have to put periods in certain spaces, and if you do put a period, you can always start a new sentence. Just because one school didn't work out for you, you can transfer to other schools. Just because a major didn't work out for you, you can transfer to uh, or change your major. Uh, just because an experience of a major and an institution didn't work out for you, doesn't mean that some university or some experience of being in college does not work for you. So. Even some of the benefactors of some of the largest companies, and we talk about Fortune 500 companies, I know a lot of people have this conversation and say, well, Kelvin, Bill Gates dropped out of college. Uh, why should I stay? He's a billionaire. Why, why would I stay in school and I have the opportunity to make way more money without having to spend as much money? What, what's the benefit for me in being here? If my mom wants me to be here, and I don't, why am I, why do I, why should I choose to stay? And my conversation from that point is, why do anything? If you really want to maximize your life and your life experience, and you're doing it for others, then the benefit that you get, they don't really get to see. You get that benefit. The lens of your experience literally comes from your eyes. So, for example, there's a camera watching me now, that camera gets to enhance the experience of anybody who chooses to rewatch this video that may be taped. However, there are several other individuals here who are watching the same experience and they're intaking this much differently. So if I am a student and I'm saying I'm here for the experience of somebody else, they're not ever going to get the experience that you have. You get that experience. So it is upon you, it is your responsibility to take it within yourself and say, what is the experience that I want? Why am I here? And if you don't have a reason, it's even more of a space for you to dig deep and say, you know what, why am I here? What purpose am I serving by being here? Am I just here because somebody else wants me to be here? And if that's the case, what benefit can I grasp from this? Because once you're done with your degree program, your degree has your name on it, no one else's. And when you decide to apply for different positions, when you decide to embark yourself in, in different opportunities, your name is what's going to be on your resume. Your name is what's going to be on those applications. Your name is going to be on the awards that you receive from your recognition of doing whatever that you're doing. So I always encourage students, maximize the experience for you. If you are here on the behalf of anybody else, that's great, it's wonderful. It can be a part of your motivation, but for most people, as a psychological tip, fear is motivation, and motivation dies. So if you get motivated to say, okay, I'm gonna come to school, I'm gonna be the greatest, I don't know, I'm gonna be the greatest, I'm gonna be the greatest optometrist ever, but you don't like anything about optometry, you don't like anything about chemistry, biology, change your major, make it your experience. Do the thing that you feel is going to give you the most joy and the most influence in order for you to move to the next space.
Okay, so, quick uh, break in between, but I want to speak a little bit about delayed gratification. So for a lot of individuals, uh, delayed gratification is not something that our current society likes to talk a lot about because we are in a, a very high traffic, I want it right now, microwave generation where I put in this little bit and I want to get a whole lot out and I want to get it out right now. Well, college is not like that at all. You are literally putting in little by little as you go to your classes, as you go to different events and you learn more about the experience of what you are in, your degree comes much later. So the delayed gratification of you actually getting all of the things that you put in may not come to two, three, four, even five or six years, depending on your path. That gratification comes later on. So with you deciding that you want to attend the institution, and, and most college students make their decision and move forward with it, excuse me, that delayed gratification is something hard to, to really grasp. And my best example for it is using a microwave and an oven as an analogy. Yes, there are products that you can put in a microwave and it's gonna come out, but it may not come out the way that you want it to come out and it might not taste as good. But if you put that same product in the oven and you wait the prescribed time, and you put it on the right temperature and you put it in the right setting, it can come out amazing. We're talking about the same food item. For example, I like to eat pie pies, give a little information about myself. Um, the pie pie is a microwave. I could just take it, take it out the little cart, throw it in the microwave, let it cook for the six to eight minutes, so whatever prescribed time, take it out, break the crust, eat the, eat the pie pie. But the experience is not the same as me taking the pie pie, putting it into the pre oven, first of all, then putting it into the oven, then waiting for it to cook, or usually it's about an hour, and then after the hour has passed by, I get to take it out of the oven, it's piping hot, the crust is all nice and brown and golden, and the experience of the pie pie is way better in my opinion. So, knowing that the delayed gratification of something so small as a pie pie could be related to your experience of coming to university is almost very similar. Yes, could you get into a degree? Could you get into certain programs? Sit there, take the time to go to the classes, take the years and the long nights and the papers and the stress of an entire time to get a degree? You could. You also could go to microwave way. You could go into small certification programs. You could go into uh, trade schools to get almost an instant or a, a faster approach in order to get those staple things. You could do that. Now, would it provide you with the same result? Yeah, you still get the food from the pie pie, but it might not taste the same. And it's not to say that anyone is better or worse, it's just based off the preference of your taste and what you're willing to wait for. So. Uh, I say that all to say college being a scam is something that it took me being in higher education field to really truly learn. It can be a scam if you allow it to be, but it is not a scam if you really truly involve yourself and use all the resources that are given to you. And like I said before, even some of the resources that aren't given to you, you can take what you see and make it into what you want. You create your reality when it comes to the college experience. So when a lot of students say, my college experience is whack, it's boring, there's nothing to do here, I don't see anything, it's just a lot. So what are you doing? Are you going to your room, going to class, going to the dining hall, going back to your room? That's the reason why it's boring. You're not involving yourself. You're not putting yourself in positions to try to foster a change. So you get in what you put out. If you decide that you want to make a little risk, you get a little return. But the higher your risk is, the more insight that you put, the more energy that you put into your experience, the more likely you are to get out a great experience. And that is the culmination of college not being a scam. Uh, I know that there is an opportunity for Q&A, &A, so I believe, uh, Mr. Mickle, is that something that you want to do now? Okay. So 
Okay. So first of all, um, can we give Mr. Kelvin Miller a round of applause? Okay. Now we will take any questions that you might have. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay, we have a question. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Miller. <clears throat> what are some uh, student organizations you were involved in, and what are some transferable skills that you learned from these student orgs? Great question, uh, Mr. Hopkins, thank you. So, um, one of the organizations that I was a part of while I was here uh, was SGA, which is Student Government Association. I was also a part of CEC. But the one that I had the most influence and impact in was an organization by the name of Student African American Brotherhood. And in that organization, I was uh, involved as the initial secretary. That was my first position. I was a general member first, and then I became the secretary by default because the current secretary at the time had graduated. So they were like, hey, we need somebody to take notes. Kelvin, you want to do it? I was like, I guess. Um, so I started taking notes in those meetings and from my note taking, I learned a lot about how to run our organization properly. Uh, I learned a lot about Robert's Rules of Orders, which to this day I, I do not like, but it provides a very good structure for how to establish and run meetings uh, professionally. So that's one transferable skill I did learn uh, in that position or that role. And from becoming the secretary, I went on to become the vice president, and then from becoming the vice president, I went on to become the president of the organization. And that taught me how to work with others that didn't like me. So, for example, we had a voting process for the organization in order to make elections happen uh, for different positions and cabinet members. If you wanted to be in a certain position, you would run for that position, and then those individuals who are members would vote. Well, the first time I ran for vice president, uh, it was like a tie. And there were a couple of guys that were in our organization that didn't take too well to me because I was somewhat popular on campus. Uh, but in the end, uh, I ended up getting the, the position, of course, and we ended up working together. And although they did not like me personally, it became a point where it was just a matter of respect. So we would have conversations and I would let them know we don't have to be best friends, we don't have to be buddy-buddy, you don't have to like me, that's fine, but there has to be a level of respect in order for us to work to make this organization work. And with that being said, we made it work. Uh, sometimes it wasn't always great. Sometimes we had some very intense meetings. Uh, sometimes we had some headbutts, arguments, some fights. But from those experiences, I learned different people from different backgrounds perceive leadership differently. And that taught me just within the organization how to transfer the skills of being a good communicator, being able to be very straightforward but not be rude or brash uh, with my delivery when it came to certain topics or just certain decisions that needed to be made. Uh, when you're working in an organization that has a budget and there's a line item that doesn't quite make sense and you bring it to your captain and you say, hey, What's going on with this? Why are we spending $300 on promotion and nobody's showing up? Something's wrong. We, we need to go back to the drawing board. Now, depending on how that's relayed, the person who is the treasurer or the person who's over marketing might take offense to that person and say, what you trying to say? You doing my job? You know, I can't do what I'm supposed to do? No, I'm just saying that whatever we're doing right now is not working. So what can we do to, to translate what's not working into something that is working. Let's try something different, let's try something new and see if we get a better result. We get a better result, awesome. Now we know that that was the issue, that's something we don't have to do again. And those types of things and experiences translated to me coming into my professional career when I was working with individuals who had been doing the same thing over and over and over again. It wasn't working. And their number one thing is, we, wanted this, we want this to work. So put it on your desk, put it on your table, kill them, make it work. Okay, well, we got to do something new. So, uh, transferable skills of being able to learn how to work with people and how to be assertive and be commanding in a room definitely helped uh, with my organizational skills. 
And then any type of networking opportunities, I learned as I went who to speak to, why should I speak to them. Everybody's important. There's no one that you're going to meet that you don't treat with the same level of respect. So you treat the, the janitor the same way you treat the president. You treat the vice president the same way you treat the treasurer. You, you treat a normal member the same way you would treat someone off the street and everybody has the same level of respect. To understand who you are as a person, that your character remains the same regardless of who you meet. So that's something I can say that I learned that was very beneficial uh, to me later on in my college career. We have someone else with a question. Hello. Uh, my name is Abel Aguilar, and I wanted to ask, uh, did you ever work with those who struggle with, uh, with limitations, either physically or mentally? Yes, uh, so I did have the, and I, I, I call it a pleasure, uh, I had the pleasure of working with uh, two individuals who had uh, disabilities. One had a physical disability, the other one had a speech impediment. And in those positions, uh, I was in a leadership position. I served as a supervisor as well as a colleague to one of the individuals. And the person that had the speech impediment often had to do presentations. And it was very difficult for them to uh, speak in front of large crowds because of their speech impediment. And they felt uh, discouraged to kind of do, you know, certain presentations and things of that nature. Um, I mentioned to them that it's not necessarily what you say all the time, but how you say it. So having the encouragement within themselves to practice in front of a mirror, practice in front of your friends, practice in front of people that you're comfortable with, and the more that you practice, the better off you are when it comes to actually presenting and being, you know, there to support them when they did their presentations and say, hey, it's okay if you have a speech impediment. Keep going, don't stop. Like, don't let any of your limitations that you may feel are there physically stop you from being the great person that you are. So, with working with those individuals, it taught me a lot about perseverance because I knew for individuals who didn't have those same limitations but would give excuses, I could say, I have somebody who has more limitations than you and they're doing twice as much work. So now, look at them as being your influence. Look at them as being someone that you could be motivated by and it typically worked out with. Any other questions? One of your most memorable experiences in college. Ooh. Most most memorable experience. One of um, have a lot. Uh, I was I was in school for almost six years, so I got a lot of experiences. I went to Clark Atlanta for two years, transferred, and then was at Clay State for four years. Um, one of my most memorable experiences actually had nothing to do with me. Uh, when President Obama was elected, uh, that was probably one of my most memorable experiences because that was the first time I had the opportunity to vote. And to be able to see such a reaction from a community of individuals who were around the same age, it was their first opportunity to ever vote. It felt like, man, I just changed the world. Like I was a part of something that changed the entire world. And from that, uh, I can say it even motivated me too to be more involved and do things that were unorthodox or were out of the box that they weren't necessarily expecting a young black man to do. So I, I can say that was probably one of my most memorable experiences. Um, another one I would say also was being a part of, I was a part of a, an organization uh, that is still here, exists, it's called AmeriCorps. Uh, we did several service projects and we spent, God knows, I had a thousand hours of community service by myself. So, excuse me, collectively I know we had 30, 40,000 uh, hours of community service and those experiences taught me how to be appreciative of being where I was, even as a, a broke college student, 
I learned a lot about people who did not have a lot of resources and they didn't know where to go and they didn't know who to run to and we were there to provide services for them in all different types of ways, whether it was clothes, whether it was food, uh, whether it was us helping uh, remove damage from the areas that they lived in, learning more about uh, people who were in situations that they didn't necessarily put themselves in. I could say that experience in college taught me uh, uh, an awful lot uh, just about being appreciative because as a college student, there's like a range or a spectrum. You got your, your normal college student who you know just goes to classes every day, and then you got your rich ones who mommy and daddy pay for everything. They don't have to worry about anything. They don't work. They can go buy Starbucks lattes and coach purses and whatever they want, whenever they want to, because somebody's funding their entire experience, and they don't. They complain about stuff, and you're just like, what? Like, oh, my MacBook charger stopped working. I'm gonna have to call daddy for another one. I don't even have a, it took me, I, I had to wait five years to get a MacBook. So for me, I'm looking at the person with a MacBook, I'm like, I wish, like, you complaining about your MacBook charger? I, I'm barely working this little dad like I got. No, no shade to Dale, Dale's a great computer, but it wasn't a MacBook. So um, in that experience, like I said, some of those individuals were in America. So we were going to those service projects together it really showed. We had to start doing hard work. We had to start working with individuals that may have had language barriers, individuals that may not have smelled the greatest, individuals that may not have known how to have tact and communication, individuals that were frustrated with the situations that they were in. You're working with those individuals as a college student, but you're really learning how to be a good citizen. And I like the fact that AmeriCorps gave me that opportunity while I was in college. I didn't have to go to a job and get berated by people who didn't know my experience just to learn how to talk to somebody who was going through something differently than me. So when I went into other jobs, I went into, the, went into those jobs with the mindset of anybody that I meet, whether it's a customer or a client, uh, anybody that's coming to that space could be going through absolutely anything and look like nothing's going on. So I have to treat them with the same level of respect with my job position to say, hey, I'm here, you know, I'm here for you. I know, you know, I got a job to do, but I'm here for you. So what is it that I can provide for you in my service or in my position that is gonna allow you to do or get whatever you need? And if there is something that I can't provide, at least let me refer you to the person who needs to give you the information that you need in order to proceed with whatever you wanna do. Thank you for that question, that was a good question. Any other questions? I have one quick question for you. Yes, sir. If there was anything that you could do over, because it seems like you had an experience that you really learned a lot from, and we appreciate you sharing um, your experiences, but if you could go back in time, what would you do different? So if there is one thing that I could do over, this is one thing I would tell every student, I would yell this at the mountaintops, if I did not have to sign for a single student loan, I would not have done it. Um, the ability and the opportunity to get your college paid for is there, is definitely there. I would not have taken out one loan. I, I mean, I would have been in financial aid probably fighting people to say, don't do, don't do it, don't sign for it, don't click the button to say, I'm signing my life away, just don't do it, just do not do it. If you can get scholarships, if you can, um, if you can, market yourself while you're in high school, even while you're still in school, for you students who are still in school, look for the scholarship opportunities that are there. They are there. The money is definitely there. I'm looking at students get hundreds of thousands of dollars literally because they're left-handed or because they were living in the right area at the right time. There's literally a scholarship going on right now. Um, it's a $500 scholarship. You can go on Twitter, you literally just have to tweet your Black History Month person that you, you like or that you're or, or familiar with, something that they influenced you by, and that literally enters you into the scholarship. Now, I don't want to date myself, but back in my day, we had to write letters and all of these long, drawn out explanations of why we wanted money to just say, all you gotta do is send a tweet for a scholarship, I would do it if I was you. So, um, things of that nature, look for the resources, like I said, look for the resources that aren't there. If there's something that you need, 
go find it. And if it's not there, create it. You could literally be the reason why there is a scholarship fund for students who are in their third semester and they're struggling because financial aid is not paying anymore. They maxed out their loans. Their parents are saying, I ain't signing for no more loans for you, but I still want to complete school. You could be the reason why a scholarship fund is created because you have put in the emphasis and the energy to say, I need this. So that would be one thing. I would, those two things that I would definitely say, I would never sign for another loan in my life. Thank you, Mr. Kelvin Miller. Please give him one more round of applause.